welcome to our webinar, Hope for the Holidays, Finding Light in the Darkest Times of the Year. My name is John Sitko, Director of Programs for the Catholic Apostle Center, and I will be your host for this presentation. I'm pleased to welcome our presenter for this webinar, Paul Jarzembowski, Associate Director for the Laity at the Secretariat for Laity, Marriage, Family Life, and Youth at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. He is also the author of recent books, Hope for the Holidays, which is our presentation today, as well as Hope in the Ashes, which is a very good book discussing Lent and, uh, Lent and Ash Wednesday, which are both by Paul's Press. Among other positions, he is a former diocesan director of young adult ministry for the Diocese of Joliet in Indiana, and has experience in parish and multi-parish regional outreach of young adults in their 20s and 30s, as well as has experience as a campus minister at a local community college. If you have any technical issues during this presentation, please send a message in the chat box on the bottom right of the screen, Ms. Staff, and I will try to assist you. In addition, feel free to type any questions you have for us um, at the right of your screen. And with that, I'll open us in prayer. May the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, please grant those who are attending and preparing themselves for the Advent and Christmas season, as well as in the Thanksgiving season, that they themselves may welcome you in the second coming, as well as preparing and commemorating your birth through this Christmas and Advent season. And we ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So, Paul, I appreciate you uh, joining us for this webinar. And I guess I wanted to start with, um, as we've talked about back and forth, what's one thing that is giving you joy and excitement during this holiday season? Oh, thank you very much for, for asking. Um, as you mentioned uh, in my bio, so I work at the U.S. Bishops Conference, and that's headquartered in Washington, D.C. And one of the traditions that my wife, Sarah, and I have started um, through the last decade that we've been here in Washington, D.C., um, uh, is going to some of the military concerts, um, the military concerts of the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines. They each have a, a free Christmas concert in the, uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, and so we like to go to them because, first of all, they're great musicians, and uh, they really just give us a lot of excitement and joy uh, to be able to see uh, our, our, our servicemen and women uh, performing these these wonderful uh, holiday classics. Um, it's also a nice thing. The many of the places that they one of the places that they perform is a, a location that's very near the White House. So then my wife and I love going to see. The, uh, the White House Christmas tree immediately um, after our concert. And so we get a chance to kind of experience Washington, D.C. Uh, in, in holiday splendor. And so that's just something I just, I look forward to each year. How about yourself? I mean, I think for me, I grew up in a town called Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which is monikered Christmas City, USA. <laughs> and so growing up, didn't realize that this was not a thing in other places, but they go all out during, basically from Thanksgiving and even a little bit before till the till the new year. Um, they do like the Christmas tree on the lights, they do the tinsel all over the place, uh, wreaths galore. Uh, they even have a, a star Bethlehem lit up in metal um, that is lit up basically after 5 p.m. every night for the month of December. And so there's just a lot of this sort of maybe secular, but like Christmas spirit. Um, and, you know, it, it provides me a sense of home because I literally come home to experience this. And, you know, in a lot of other towns I visited and a lot of other cities, it's just not as front and center as a part of like, this is, this is what we believe in as a, as a town and as a culture. Um, and so there is just something very welcoming and very, very home-like whenever I visit. Well, that's wonderful. Now, of course, we know that there is also this time of year can be a little bit trying for some. So, um, so what stresses you out about the holidays? What are you, what are you most anxious for as we, as we kind of go dive further into the holiday season? I mean, honestly, the, the thing that stresses me out the most is just the, the hustle and bustle of literally everything that has to do prior to Christmas day, you know, the shopping of gifts for people you forget about or, or gifts in general, the, uh, uh, perennial darkness that happens when it's four 30, I haven't even left work yet and it's already pitch black. Um, and you're just experiencing eternal darkness for three months out of the year. And, and just like the general stresses of like this cold and dark period. But I think like the, it's all rolled up into this idea that like, I, I lose focus on what the season is about. 
And it provides a level of stress because I'm like, am I doing enough to prepare for uh, Advent and Christmas of, of not only commemorating Christ's birth, but commemorate and remembering and preparing for the second coming as, as is our tradition and understanding what Advent and Christmas are really about. It's as much about remembering the past as it is preparing for the future. And so, you know, even right now I'm talking and I'm, I'm fairly stressed about it, thinking about the fact that it's a yes. short period of time to prepare for these things, unlike Lent, for example, which right. has a little bit of a wider period. And as you wrote and understand through hope in the ashes, that, that that period of welcoming and preparation is a little bit longer. So there's a little bit more time to do it. But on the flip side, what, what gives you some stresses and anxiety? Well, one of the things I mean, you've caught me uh, at this uh, when this recording is taking place, um, I'm at my family home in uh, in Northwest Indiana in the Diocese of Gary, Indiana, um, with my parents' house. So, so that's where that's the setting I'm in. Um, and when I return for Thanksgiving, when I turn when when I can reconnect with family uh, around uh, Christmas and the holiday season, um, I'm reminded also of the family who aren't here. Um, I had wonderful experiences growing up, my grandfather, my grandmother, my aunts, my uncles. Um, and I remember some great holiday traditions that we would do as children that at this time of year, um, I seem to recall those memories and I miss them terribly. So there's a bitter, so I don't say I, I'm like more or less stressed about it, but there is a sense of sadness that is part of, of, of the Christmas where I am missing many of those uh, family members who are no longer with us. Um, I, you know, we pull out pictures uh, to remember them, uh, you know, thinking of ornaments I'm hanging on the tree that my grandmother got me or my grandpa did. Um, and so it, it reminds me of those who aren't here. And, um, and so there's this little sense of sadness and kind of missing them. Uh, that's very heartbreaking at this time of year. And I get a little sad and depressed. Uh, that I don't have those uh, the the current Christmas opportunities now that I'm a much I'm, I've matured and I can uh, really appreciate the gift that they were I can't thank them and now I can't thank them in person and so that that causes me a little sadness to know that the Christmases are a little and the and the Thanksgivings and all those and all these holiday things are not quite as special as they might have been when I was a kid and so um, that kind of saddens me a little bit and and that kind of that mix of the of the joys and the sadnesses, um, what St. Ignatius of Loyola calls desolations and consolations, um, is part of why I kind of approach this. And I think it's good for us to be aware of it. Um, I'm going to share my screen to give you some, some realities that many people are experiencing this time of year. Things that give us hope and things that we can get excited about but also things that we also need to be aware of at this time of year um, that are both the consolations and the desolations. So I'll share my screen awkwardly for a moment. Uh, and I know that you've got a few little announcements as well. Yeah, as Paul is, is hopefully quickly putting on the screen, uh, if anyone has any questions during the chat uh, or during the presentation for the end, feel, feel free to use the chat or the questions tab at the bottom of your screen. Also, um, we'll mention it again, but um, if you go to paulspress.com, you'll be able to order both this book as well as Hope in the Ashes, um, which is Paul's first book discussing a lot of the Ash Wednesday sort of experience and welcoming points. Um, but, you know, with that, yeah, there we go. With that, we go. Uh, let Paul continue his presentation. Wonderful. So yes, hope for the holidays. Um, and again, that hope I, um, as, as, as John has been sharing, my previous book was called Hope from the Ashes. Uh, this was called Hope for the Holidays. You can still, you can tell I'm a person of great hope. And so uh, there, I do believe that in the midst of all the desolations around this time of year, and even some of the excitements that we can deepen that hope even further. Um, one of the things that gives me a lot of hope as a church worker is what I witness every year at Christmas uh, and Advent and Christmas. Um, this particular chart is a list of the 52 weeks of church attendance uh, in Catholic churches. And you see that generally the it hovers around that upper, that 20 percentile is what we usually get for most of the year, 
But during the Advent and then especially on Christmas, those numbers shoot up quite a bit. And I think that this is uh, part of the hope that that there is a, re, a reconnection to faith communities at this time of year. Uh, we even noticed it during the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, we noticed that uh, even people who are viewing online, that that viewership in churches uh, of, of live stream masses and live stream services still happen at these various moments through the year. And Christmas uh, and, and this uh, the, the Advent time of year was certainly occasions for that. So that, those are, from a church worker's point of view, there's a great hope. Um, yeah, that the 24 <clears> percent <throat> who go um, regularly to church, that's kind of the amount of Catholics who come on a regular basis uh, that turns into on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, it turns into 72%. So uh, that includes a lot of people who come maybe monthly or maybe only just a few times a year or maybe hardly ever. Um, that 72% of uh, self-identified Catholics uh, and Christians will, will come to church on Christmas Day. Um, that's a moment of great hope that's exciting uh, that so many people have joined us. Other things that I get excited about this time of year is the increase also of charitable giving and justice work. So here you see a chart that since the, you know, that, that our, our total giving that we give on an annual basis um, has risen through the years, that giving now is greater than it, than it has been uh, in the past. Uh, and this is occasion of great hope. I mean, there've been some spells where things haven't been so great, but I, I'm really happy to see that that annual giving is continually going up. Um, that's a moment of hope. And then Specifically, 30% of all that annual giving occurs in December. 69% um, give through financial donations, 25% give through their volunteer efforts. Another thing that gives me great hope is kind of looking, we, we kind of wonder these days, oh, will young people continue this experience? Are, uh, is hope lost for the future generations? Well, our, our charitable giving numbers actually show us that uh, while 72% of boomers give to charity, 84% of millennials are giving to charity. Millennials being those who are currently in their, many of them in their young adult years. Now, the average uh, annual donation uh, is less than previous, but also remember millennials are younger in their career. They have many, they have more bills to pay often uh, in their young life. So um, so their their amount of giving is is more than ha half of what the, their, uh, their, their boomer compatriots are, are giving, but there are more of them who have a habit of giving, and that is an occasion of great hope. Now, uh, another thing is that at this time of year, we also know that a lot of people are spending more time with their families. And so we know that um, when asked a, a recent study that the Pew Research Center did, said that spending time with family is one of the most important things uh, that people have on a personal level. Even if they, they don't have, even if they may not spend that much time with family, they recognize it as very important. And uh, I think around the holiday season, we see that coming, um, especially as traffic patterns and, and airplanes and all the travel that happens is so big because people want to read, want to spend time with family, even if they're far removed from them. Um, we also see that practicing religious faith is also the next thing that, that people really uh, find very important. Um, and so that's good as well. Now, on the flip side, some of the consolations and why this time of year perhaps draws people to give, to want to spend time with family, to want to be in a place of sacredness and spirituality is because some of the things that people are going through right now. Here are some statistics through the National Association of Mental Illness. They note that 38% of people report their stress increasing during the holidays, and that 68% of people feel financially strained, especially this time of year. 50% of people are unable to see their loved ones, even though they desire it as important. 57% of people feel they can't live up to the commercial expectations. So there's a sense of failure. There's a sense of not feeling good enough. 64% of people with mental illness do report that the holidays make their conditions worse. So there is a lot of grief and struggle that goes on this time of year. And 66% of people experience loneliness at this time of year. 
So while these are not occasions of hope, they are moments of desolation that are screaming for moments, experiences of consolation, which do draw people in. Now, when asked what is the primary reason people attend church at Christmas time, it is, of course, to honor Jesus. That is first. But also, again, observing tradition, being with family and friends, getting into the Christmas spirit. About 2% aren't sure why they're there, but they're there anyway. Um, so that is something that is, again, occasions of hope that people, there is a religiosity, a spirituality, perhaps a great spirituality that many Americans do experience. And the holidays are a, a, a give them the ability to articulate that, to experience it, to profess it, to honor it. Even, uh, um, especially among Catholics, when asked about uh, how do you ever participate in Catholic activities because it's important for your family or close friends, even if you don't personally believe in them, um, a majority of people do say that uh, that they do that. Um, and, uh, and this, I think, applies to Christmas as well. I think that people will come even if they're not sure why, but they, again, because of that strong connection to family, which I think is very critical, uh, they are drawn in. Uh, you even see that even amongst those, this is, this is true for those who attend Mass weekly, as well as those who attend Mass only a few times a year. It's about the same amount as you see on this chart. So what, what in general is drawing people to make a moment of return? If it, uh, we, for, many it's, for many, it's honoring Jesus. Uh, some are doing it because of obligation to family. But when you think about generally when people reconnect, there's about seven things that um, that I'd like to offer are, are reasons for why people make moments of return. And this is true both for, uh, for Lent and Ash Wednesday as they are for weddings and funerals, uh, baptisms as they are for Advent and Christmas and just in general around the holidays. So one of those is that they are seeking peace, rest, and refuge. I mentioned before about the great amount of mental health issues that are present as a part of this, uh, especially that are amplified by the, the holiday season. So people are seeking peace, rest, and refuge that can come about because of uh, the, their, this, this, this drawing to faith. People, Some people are discovering, rediscovering or discovering anew a spirituality that is accessible to all, regardless of their religiosity. The Christmas time is a very, people recognize it is sacred. And so there is something to the fact that, uh, that they feel that they, those who want to be spiritual rediscover that spirituality of this time. Uh, going, making a moment of return, even if it's just momentarily, um, helps people being able to, to commit to something. And, and, and commitment can be a struggle for many people today. So to be able to commit to going to church on Christmas day or Christmas Eve, um, allows them to, to, to be able to commit to something, um, that that commitment, even if it's a momentary one, is one that they're proud of. Um, renewing or making a resolution to do better and to be better is often a reason why people reconnect. People know that they fall short uh, of where they ought to be. And so reconnecting for a moment of return, like around Advent and Christmas, is an opportunity for them to renew that to renew their souls, to renew their, their promises to God, to, to make a resolution to be better. Um, and we can't dismiss that this, I, this idea of, of being and doing better is part of their story. There is comfort in tradition. And in the Christmas and Advent time, we have a lot of traditions. Um, you know, John and I were just talking about some of the traditions that, that we remember at this time of year. And traditions often come to the forefront, whether they're in our families, they're in our culture, they're in our churches. And so it kind of affirms their Christian identity in, in, in this. And so they'll reconnect with church because they remember the traditions they either grew up with or that they hold personally sacred. There's a, sea of, there's a sense of accomplishment that they feel when they come. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of people who uh, feel a sense of failure. They haven't, aren't really living up to the expectations that, the, that perhaps the secular culture uh, you know, seems to impose upon us. Um, so they feel like they have fallen short of that. And so by making a moment of return, there is a sense of accomplishment. I'm, I'm actually not as bad as I probably think I am. And that sense of accomplishment is something that's very special for them. And we shouldn't minimize that, that them coming to church, even if it's for a day, even if it's for a moment, 
is an accomplishment and we need to acknowledge it and draw it draw them closer into that and finally there is uh, at this time of year um, people recognize the value of family kind of know that they that because of family they belong to something bigger and so that many of them are seeking a sense of belonging whether it's with their family their their immediate family their extended family as well as the family of faith and so may, many of them make a moment of return because they want to belong to something that is, that goes beyond them and there's something about the sacredness of the church the sacredness of these special moments during the holiday season that allow them to experience this belonging So how can we respond? There's a couple of ideas that, are, that I have included uh, in the book, but I wanna offer a few to get you started. Just a few ways that we can respond to all of the things I've just shared uh, to be able to, uh, to be Christ for those who are making moments of return. First, first suggestion, uh, is mobilizing your active churchgoers and involving them in the welcoming. So as we know, uh, people do not make moments of return uh, alone. Uh, they know that there are there is a community that wants to welcome them. And so we too know that, 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 it, that if 72% of self-identified Christians and Catholics are going to be coming to church, that we may need to uh, be have the whole community be mobilized in that effort, that it's not just one person. We alone ourselves cannot uh, mobilize to, to, to respond uh, to, the, to the vast amount of people who are making the connection. So the first thing is really getting more people involved to making this a community effort. Um, during the season of Advent, hosting evenings of peace and quiet for mental health during the season, we do a lot of Advent programming, and I'm sure that everyone's got a different thing that they like to do, but sometimes what people are longing for most, especially with our mental health crisis that we're in as a, as a culture, as a world, as a country, is to just be a place where people know that they can find peace, tranquility, and quiet. I mean, the most popular Christmas song of all of the Christmas songs, I'm not sure if you know, is Silent Night. Um, and I have to think that there's a reason why Silent Night is the, is the most popular of all the Christmas songs. People are looking for silence. They are looking for peace. They are looking for tranquility. And I think that in Advent, we have many tools in our Catholic and Christian tool belts uh, that we can use at this time of year, whether it's Taizé, whether it's candlelight, whether it's adoration, whether it's reconciliation services, but moments of peace and quiet and, and really kind of almost presenting it as such in the wider culture, I think can be a welcome respite for those who are struggling uh, in, that, in those moments of desolation at this time of year. Third is assuming nothing, especially about the motives of our guests. I think this kind of gets to our own uh, I've been guilty of this, our own, our own uh, prejudices against those who might make a moment of return, thinking, oh, you finally showed up. And also to see them about as guests. I think that there is, um, and I use that word intentionally, um, you know, St. Benedict once uh, advised his communities to welcome the stranger as if you were to welcome Christ the guest. And, um, you know, uh, we even sing people look east in our enduring advent and, and Christ the guest is on his way. But in this, Christ is present in the people who only come once a year. Yes, Christ is present in the people who come 52 weeks a year or to daily mass. But Christ is also very present in the person who comes but once a year. And so assume nothing about their journey. Um, one of the, in my book, I use the, uh, the framing device of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And so uh, in a way, uh, you, you know, we don't want to assume anything about the motive because the, the person who's making a moment of return may have had their own dark night of the soul um, and they might be returning on Christmas because throughout the Advent season, throughout the holiday season, their heart moved closer to Christ. Um, even if this is the first time, even if they're uncertain about coming, uh, assuming nothing about that journey and just 
welcoming them as if they are Christ entering our door, I think is key. Four kind of goes with that. Uh, don't shame the guests. And I say, give them the best seats in the house. So I have a very practical way we can do this. I don't know about you, but I know that Christmas Eve masses, you know, those Christmas Eve, late afternoon, early evening masses are usually the probably the most crowded in our churches. Um, a lot of families come out for that. Um, and, and oftentimes, if you're an active churchgoer, the, 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 the trick you learn is that you probably arrive to the church an hour, maybe two hours before the mass starts. So you can get the best seat because you know that if you arrive late, there's not going to be much room available. My, uh, my challenge to people is, yes, get there an hour or two before mass. Sit in that pew while you're waiting. And then right before the liturgy, maybe a few moments before, as somebody who's frazzled, coming in late, probably there for the first time in, in a year, they're looking for a seat. You get out of your seat, you stand, and let the person who has just shown up have the best seat in the house. Give them your seat, and you stand for the Christmas Eve Mass or the Christmas Day Mass. It's a radical sense of welcoming, um, but what a great opportunity that can be. So that's not only not shaming them, but offering them the best seats and making them our honored guests. And finally, um, a fifth suggestion is following up uh, with those Advent and Christmas guests well into the new year. Um, this might involve uh, perhaps getting information for them. So if you have like a prayer card with like contact information in the pews for people on, on Christmas, uh, and then following up with them uh, in the new year, um, you know, letting them know that we enjoyed seeing them and they are welcome to come in January. Um, and then Lent follows soon after. So there might be some opportunities during Lent, but following up with our guests into the new year can turn uh, a moment of return into um, a, a, the beginning of a milestone uh, of, their, of their faith lives. So these are just five suggestions. I've got many more, but these are at least five to get started as to ways for us to respond. So, um, so I'm going to stop sharing and, and, uh, and John, we can, we can have more of a conversation here. Thank you, Paul, for this. Uh, I guess my first question for you, and, and we, as we were prepping for this webinar, we had talked that a good framing device would be talking about sort of the book itself, as well as sort of what has inspired you. So I guess the first question I have is why, for Hope for the Holidays, did you choose A Christmas Carol as your framing device? Well, first, it is one of my favorite stories. I, um, you know, usually every... December, I usually kind of go through a string of watching the different versions and I've got my favorites, you know, and they, um, and, and if you're, and I know you haven't asked, but I will tell you that they are uh, Mickey's and, and the Muppets, and then also the George C. Scott and the Patrick Stewart versions. Um, those are my favorites. Um, and I love, but I love watching all of them. There's a lot of good ones and they keep having new ones every year. I, I, I use it as a framing device because it's a story that that most people are familiar with. Um, you know, it's not one where you have to do spoiler alert um, because most people have heard the story. They, they kind of, even if they haven't read the book, they've maybe seen a version. Um, they've maybe heard, they, they kind of know what a Scrooge is. Um, although poor Scrooge, because, uh, you know, we always think when we talk, when we use that phrase Scrooge, uh, we use that to refer to pre-conversion Scrooge as opposed to post-conversion Scrooge. So if somebody calls you a Scrooge this year, just assume that they're calling you the post-conversion Scrooge. But I used it because it's a, it's, it's a device that, that even people who aren't um, active in their faith lives, um, they, they can still enter into that story. It's also a quintessential story of, of conversion of heart, of moving from despair and desolation to consolation and hope. Um, and Scrooge goes through that moment. Um, and it's a journey that many, many of us go through during the Advent Christmas season. Our hearts are moved towards Christ, just like the miser Ebenezer. And we find ourselves kind of going, we, we have moments where we look to our past, we look to our present, we look to the future during this season. And so I thought that what a great tool to use um, you know, that to kind of follow in the footsteps of Ebenezer, uh, who's been there before, um, who knows the journey and can help us find our way as well. So I use this as a device because I thought it was very accessible to people. 
even people who who people who have people of faith know the story, but also people who have who don't have the who aren't active in a faith community also know that story. So I thought it was a good kind of entry point for everyone. For those who sort of a, as a quick follow up, but for those who don't, haven't already purchased your book, who is your intended audience? That's a good question. So the intended audience, I, I, I don't want to say it's everyone because that sounds like a cop out. But um, but but one thing I have discovered is more people I, I, so are, are are in need of a sense of hope than I think I realize. So it really does kind of veer close to so many people. So I think if anybody who is struggling uh, through the holiday season, if they are a person of faith who thinks that everything's become so commercialized, that can be a moment of despair. We, the, 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 the church leader needs hope, but also the person who uh, is grieving the loss of somebody. We, we talked about some of our desolations at the beginning, uh, whether it be, I can't quite get into the season, whether it's the darkness and the seasonal depression, whether it's remembering uh, the loss of a loved one, or maybe, maybe there's a family brokenness. If that applies to anyone, and I think it probably, each of us has our own moments of despair, during this time of year, then that book is for them just to kind of give them an opportunity to see, you know, where can I find the hope in that? So the intended audience is uh, people who are active in faith, people who are not active in faith. Again, the same kind of in a way, the same audience Charles Dickens may have had for A Christmas Carol, um, I kind of hope would be a similar type of audience. But anyone who's really looking to find a little bit of light uh, in, in this time of year, um, and I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to find somebody who says, no, I'm good. I got it all. So as a, as something you've talked about a couple of different times now, and, and I sort of mentioned this to you when I reread it, you, you talk a lot about this sort of idea of desolation, um, mm -hmm. which for some people might be familiar terminology for others who are on this, probably not. So would you care to explain a little bit what you mean by this desolation as well as mm -hmm. more broadly, when you talked about sort of the, the, I wouldn't go so far as to say crisis, but the concerns about mental health, especially around this time of year, for ministers or leaders of the church, what are some things you would recommend to them to help guide those people who will probably come to their doors that experience those feelings of loneliness, of despair, of sadness, um, you know, or even just stress and anxiety? All of those experiences you just mentioned are really symptoms of, of desolation. Desolation is where the presence of God is, it feels like it's farther away. Um, and desolation is really um, a, a distance from the presence of God in our lives in the world. Um, so when we are isolated, we are, we are further away from God's presence in the community. When we are sad, we are, when there's sadness that overwhelms us, um, we are moving away from the joy that Christ gives us. Um, and not, sometimes it's not intentional on our part. It's not like we're actively moving away, although sometimes it is. I mean, experiences of sin are part of desolation because they're, we are intentionally moving away from God's presence. But then there are things that just happen to us where we are, where the world kind of draws us deep further away from God's saving power. And, um, and we can kind of let these things kind of compound upon each other. So if loneliness is, is just something, if, if depression, a clinical depression is a real thing, um, it, is, it is experienced by so many, it, it, that's not a sin, but when the depression draws us away from people and draws us away from the help that we need, um, draws us away from the community that can support us, then we, it, it compounds and then that leads to further things. The further we isolate, we then get suspicious of each other. And then that leads to polarization. And then it just, it's a cycle that continues to be kind of this cycle of desolation. And so, um, but the mental health realities are, are real. Um, and again, they're of no fault of anyone, but if we allow ourselves to, uh, to not seek support, um, both psychological and spiritual support for that, then we, you know, if we move away from those op those options that God gives to us through our world and through our faith, um, then that can we can find ourselves kind of spiraling out of control, and it's easy to do. And um, and I think it's 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 this is not an easy thing to do. It's not easy to climb your way out of desolation, um, 
but it does require um, support from others. And so those of us who are persons of faith, we have a responsibility to keep an eye on those in our lives who may that may be impacting and how can we draw them and how can we engage them in a way that is helpful to them so they can move towards the light, so they can move toward what we would then call the opposite of desolation, but consolation, where the fruits of the spirit are found, joy, kindness, patience, compassion, um, those types of um, of emotions and those types of fruits are present in our lives. When we find those, we know that we are inching closer towards the light. Um, so yeah, desolation and consolation. And, and, and in life, there will be moments where we feel one stronger than the other, and that's natural. Uh, the question is, how are, you know, how are we to find our way always to resist the desolation or to move, uh, to try to, with the help of others, to move towards consolation? And if we're in the consolation, to assist others who may need it as well. And so that together we can move always together towards the light. One of your points that you had made, which was pretty radical, I will say, despite how simple it is, is to basically give up your seat during mass, <laughs> uh, during the Christmas season. And I'm sure not a few people who will watch this or are participating live would be a little taken aback by that. Yeah. But why did Wait you, a minute, I, I earned that seat. Exactly, or <laughs> that is where I always sit. Exactly. Um, I know I fall into that mindset sometimes too, but I'm curious as to why do you think something like that is a, a form of radical hospitality, as you said? Well, and how, um, and I guess my other point would be, how would that help someone uh, build a further connection or a further uh, welcoming atmosphere into the community? Because for some people, it would be, they would say like, well, that's just a seat. Like, even though it, yeah, to yeah. my point, there is a certain personal attachment to just that seat. But I'm, yeah. I'm curious as to your, your thought process. So, I mean, one of the things that many people who don't come frequently to church, one of the reasons they tell us that they stay clear of us is they, they walk in and they walk out of a church and no one ever knew they were there. They, they come to faith, they come to a faith community and they felt the passive aggressive eyes. There's already a, a sense of of uncertainty, of guilt. We assume that everyone who walks in the church who hasn't been there in a while is proud of the fact that they haven't been there in a while. That's not true. Um, most people who come to church irregularly, one would say, um, uh, they, are re they recognize they don't always uh, make that. They know that that's part of their life. There's already guilt and shame that they're thrusting upon themselves. And so when they get to the church, and if that guilt and shame that's already built inside of them is compounded by someone who is then making them feel even worse about that and goes, well, maybe this isn't the place where I will find a response to my guilt and shame, but rather I should be, I, I, maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe it was a mistake for me to show up. And so they won't come the next time. But by somebody, by a person who seems like they know what they're doing, an active Catholic, going out of their way to say to them, I see you, I acknowledge you, I love you, and I want you to have the best is a gift that will maybe for them will make them feel like, first of all, I've been seen, I've been recognized. I had contact. I had an encounter with another person. And that's radical because we oftentimes, I mean, sometimes faith is such an internal experience that we don't, uh, we, we, when we go to church, we kind of, it's about me and Jesus, but true Catholic faith, the universality of our faith says it's an us in Jesus. So by doing this, by doing that act, and again, I'm not saying that every, like, I'm not expecting there to be this, this, this movement of everybody, like shifting pews on Christmas. I know that that's sometimes it's not possible and there's other factors to play in, but can you challenge yourself to think of radical ways to let other people in that space know that they are seen and they are loved and not seen in the, like, I see you, I see that you weren't here last week and now I see that you're here. Not that type of scene, but to be seen for who they are, a son and daughter of God who maybe just last night had the ghosts of Christmas past, present and future visit them. And they said, you know what, I'm going. Because actually one of the funny things, one of the things I discovered in my, in my working through this, um, my new favorite line from Dickens' book, which we hardly ever see in any of the adaptations, which is that the first thing Scrooge did when he left his home 
on Christmas morning is he went to church. Mm. He went to church. Dickens tells us, he again, most versions don't show us that, but Dickens went to church. So imagine if, again, the people in the pew were just like Scrooge and they had their night and they are going to church because they know that was the right thing to do. What, what joy to have Ebenezer Scrooge sitting, a converted Ebenezer Scrooge, sitting in the pew next to us or who we give up the, our pew for. Um, how do we offer that radical hospitality so that Christmas or whatever, or in a way, Christ can live the past, the present, and the future can live with them all the year round and not just at Christmas. And sometimes it just takes that simple act of a pew or whatever it might be, even a smile, even a convert, even a short conversation. Hi, where are you from? It's so great to see you. I don't think we've met before, but I'm so glad that you've entered into my life. No, I think that's great. And I, I always think about outside of this is the question of what do we invite people to? Right. And if we're, if we're supposed to be like, joy-filled people as you know Pope Francis has talked about as the gospels talk about you know all these kinds of things and we're we're basically territorial and being like you're an outsider interloping into our space yeah we're really embodying the gospel message especially around Christmas time and I think uh, to a similar point to your to your other book um I think that Lenten period as well is another opportunity for such a form of radical hospitality I think that in a way so I wrote this book almost as a prequel to my previous book um, uh, because um, I found that when I was talking to people about Lenten evangelization, many people said, I need to have a renewal of faith in me before I can share that with others. So you asked me who the audience was for. The initial audience when I first wrote, I was thinking of all the church leaders that I talked to about Lent and about encouraging them to be evangelistic in Lent. And many of them said, I need to be, I need to have my own faith renewed. So I initially wrote it for the leaders to say, let's give yourself a moment of, of reflection. I, 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 in a way, I hope that the, the book serves two functions for the people uh, who are on this webinar. First, for themselves to renew themselves and to find hope renewed in Lent, or sorry, in Advent. <laughs> and then to give it to someone else and to walk them through a journey of hope as well in, in Advent. And then together, hopefully during the Lenten season, which this year is only like a month and a half after Christmas, um, then, you know, we're ready to welcome those during that season because that's another moment of return that people will make. So if we can get ourselves equipped and practiced in the art of, of welcoming and the, in the art of evangelization, the art of accompaniment during the season of Advent, and if we can feel accompanied and we can feel it encountered and loved and hopeful in Advent, then we might be able to then pass that on with a lot more joy and enthusiasm during the Lenten season when we see another major uh, return moment for so many people. On a, a completely random note, and I, I told you I would mention this one, but in your book, you talk a lot about different movie references and media mm -hmm. pieces. So A, what inspired you to incorporate a lot of that? And B, what would be your takeaway for those who haven't read the book yet about why those things matter? Um, you mentioned Charles Dickens, but in there's like uh, a Wonderful Life. Uh, you and I talked about Die Hard as a reference. Uh, there was even uh, Mary Shelley Frankenstein, like all sorts of like different, like book, book and movie. I think there was even a few TV references. Mm -hmm. um, in your book. So why, you know, in a typical quote unquote Catholic book, that's usually not the modus emperendi. It's usually, you know, scriptural references or yeah. uh, opinings from a saint. So why, why did you incorporate a lot of that stuff? Well, I do have opinions from saints and scripture references in the book, but I also added the movie references. One, because for me, that gives me a lot of joy in life. I love the holiday movies. I love whether it's Halloween and watching Frankenstein or whether it's uh, you know, uh, during November in the, in the Day of the Dead and watching Coco or at Christmas time watching movies like Wonderful Life, White Christmas, uh, Elf, and yes, Die Hard. Um, I also feel kind of good knowing that there's not that many 
Catholic or Christian books out there that you have a whole page dedicated to the movie Die Hard. And, and now I think, uh, you know, there's, the, the, there's a certain sense of excitement about being able to offer that into the, uh, into the Catholic lexicon. Um, for me, I, so I was, you know, for me, much of my training was in Ignatian spirituality. And one of the tenets of Ignatian spirituality is to find God in all things. And Ignatius was not joking when he said, find God in all things. And that includes the sacred and the, the, the holy, but also the secular, um, also the everyday life, the realities that we live in every day that God longs to speak to us. And I think at the holidays, when we have a movie that gives us joy, that gives us excitement to see, that that is God's way of touching our heartstrings to say, I long for you. I want to talk with you. I want to be engaged. Your joy is kind of a doorway to something deeper. And what is that deeper? So what is it in that favorite movie you might have that we can draw out? What is Because in a way, every movie is a story. It's a story that has a beginning and an end. And oftentimes good triumphs over evil in every story in some way, shape or form including Die Hard, good triumphs over evil in Die Hard. <laughs> so that story that we all know, and whether it's a Christmas story or Christmas vacation, there is a story that, that, that goes from beginning to end. And just as God is present in our lives and our stories, God can also be present in those stories that we tell ourselves, our favorite holiday stories, which are usually in the films. And so I wanted to draw those out and kind of explore some of the themes that I've received um, now, again, this is not the definitive, uh, you know, uh, take on these films or these television shows or anything like that, but it's the way in which I wanted to share with the reader um, how God spoke to me through them and offering them and challenging the reader to say, now, now with your favorite film, with your favorite television experience, maybe you have a favorite tel uh, Christmas episode of your favorite TV show or streaming uh, show, um, whatever it might be, What? how can we go deeper with that? And what is God trying to say to you in that? And so um, I find that, and it's also in a way, and also it's a doorway of evangelization. It's a great conversation piece to somebody who may be not that religious but who maybe you share a love of a favorite, you know, maybe Christmas Vacation is both of your favorite movies you watch around this time of year and you go to church and they don't, that can be an avenue, that can be a, an open door to start having a conversation of faith starting through the lens of that film. So I offered a few of the um, uh, my thoughts on them and I, I threw in saint quotes and scripture quotes uh, in with those movies so that, you know, they could be possible ideas that might generate. And you will, and, and as a reader or a, a movie watcher or a television watcher will have their own take on it as well. And to allow wherever God spoke to you to maybe be an opportunity for God to also speak through you to a person of who's not that engaged with faith to have a faith conversation and start with the most, you know, start with cousin Eddie and, and all the, you know, and Christmas, uh, you know, vacation references or whatever it might be. Um, what a great way to begin that conversation. Yeah. I think about it. Like one of my favorite Christmas type traditions is to watch a uh, Charlie Brown Christmas special. Oh, and yeah. that is so overtly has like religious undertones. That know? one does. Yes. That one has definitely got it. And I love that, you know, um, it's one of the few times where in a secular experience, the uh, Luke's uh, account of the Christmas narrative is just spelled out verbatim uh, on screen. It's a beautiful thing. Um, but there's even lessons even beyond just reading a Christmas, the Christmas thing that there's, there's other kinds of lessons that, uh, that Linus and Charlie Brown actually offer us that, that, that even go beyond that. Yeah. That's great. Well I, uh, I have one more quick question because we're, we're rapidly running out of time and I, I've been hogging up a lot of your time. So if people have questions or comments, um, you have a couple of shout outs from friends uh, in the comments, but please feel free to uh, submit it in. But I guess one final question I had for you was, um, I believe it was, I can't remember what specific chapter you had, but you talked a lot about sort of adopting culture and adopting traditions that maybe weren't in your sort of vernacular. Um, and I, I wanted just to talk as a minister about mm -hmm. sort of the connection between sort of these cultural traditions that do have deep religious undertones, but maybe not opportune in sort of in, you know, your normal, what you grew up with. 
I think about it in terms of like, for instance, I grew up with an advent wreath, you know, especially around this time of year. And we would every uh, week lay them up and then, you know, have a advent calendar as well. But there's all sorts of traditions, especially around this time of year that have deeper religious connections. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about from your own personal experience, why you sort of uh, reflected on and adopted some. Yeah, one of the ones I shared in there is uh, the holiday around uh, Dia de las Muertes um, and the idea of the ofrenda. And uh, and for those who are not of Hispanic Latino culture, um, you might be, again, using another movie reference. If you've seen the movie Coco, uh, that's the whole premise of that is that they have uh, what they call ofrendas or altars where they put the pictures of those, the, the family members who have, who have passed uh, on that altar to remember them. And, um, and so uh, that particular tradition, um, uh, my being involved in ministry with the Hispanic Latino community, um, working with them in Pastoral Juvenil and many other uh, experiences have introduced this idea uh, to me. And so as not to try and um, appropriate their culture, that their culture is who their culture is for, but they have inspired me to reflect on my own, my own cultural lineage and so uh, in my own way, uh, we also, my wife and I put up an ofrenda in our home where pictures of our loved ones are in that. And we, we say prayers with, the, with our, you know, in, in, in that little home altar. Um, we don't have enough wall space for all the pictures, but we do have a space enough for, for some tables during, the, uh, during October, November, and December where we, we keep up a, an ofrenda in our home. I think it's so important to recognize that many of those traditions have a faith connection. Uh, whether it's a wreath, whether it's an ofrenda, whether it's the, um, you know, maybe there's a, a, you know, something related to ornaments on the tree, or maybe it's, uh, you know, the Filipino custom of Simbangabi and the lanterns that the, in their culture. Le First of all, it's helpful to learn about other cultures. You know, I think that there is such richness to the great cultural diversity in our country. And we have the opportunity, whether it's just through research on the web, but also talking to people in our lives. I mean, what an occasion for us to meet other people and have conversations of faith, um, to ask somebody of a different cultural background, what do you do? What, you know, what in your cultural background do you do for the holidays? Tell me about that, tell me the story. And then to share from your own. And even there are, there are cultural, things that are emerging as we speak, um, you know, as we, as we have this conversation, I know many people are gathering probably tonight or this week for the, for the new custom of Friendsgiving, where, where many young adults who can't afford to make it home for Christmas, we, or, or, or for, for home for Thanksgiving, can't make those, uh, those trips because of socioeconomic issues or travel issues. Um, because of that, they formed communities. And that's a tradition that's growing. So, so we have traditions that are always growing, but they all kind of connect back to faith in some way, shape, or form, whether it's the, the, the concept of community, the concept of Catholic social teaching, the concept of Eucharist and Thanksgiving, the concept, I mean, there's so many Catholic concepts that are embedded in these things. And if we study even our, our own history, our own cultural background, or we learn about the cultural experiences of others, we maybe maybe we can um, adopt and grow and adapt it for all our lives and make it uniquely ourselves. Um, that happens all the time. And uh, but to always remember that a lot of those traditions grew out of uh, a longing for light, a longing for the Lord, a longing for something deeper. Um, I, I I like to think that almost every holiday we have on the calendar you can trace back to an experience of faith because again, God's story is the human story. Um, even when before Christ, when uh, the, the people of England would gather at Stonehenge, <laughs> you know, they were longing for light in the darkness. They couldn't articulate it as Jesus Christ because they did not know him yet, but there was still a primal cry for God that was part of that. And even since then, a lot of our traditions have grown out of this longing for light that is so much a part of this year that can provide consolation for the desolation. Again, I spoke before about loneliness and one of the greatest thing, one of the greatest consolations to, to that desolation is the fact that the recognition that, that God has been speaking through cultures throughout human history and all of these cultures 
share some bit of the light and, and how they find the light. So by finding out these, these, these things, we can learn that we are not alone, that we are part of a community of faith, but also a, a human community that longs that we that that we are never God never leaves us to our own devices. He leaves us, he leaves us a community of people, whether in our faith lives or in our 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 secular lives, that are there to walk with us. And our these traditions remind us that God has been with us from the beginning, and they're kind of little hints that God wants us to be in communion with whether it's persons from our past or our present or the future, but they are wrapped up in these traditions. I think on that note, Paul, I, I can't wrap it up much better than that. So I would ask that uh, you please conclude us in prayer and then I'll do some closing remarks as well as help you promote the book. Um, so we'll go through all the, the shameless plug stuff after prayer. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> So let's just gather our thoughts wherever we are on this day, whether you're watching it live, whether you're watching this recorded, Lord, you are in our midst. You are, as you you have been called Emmanuel, God with us, uh, God among us, God in the midst of us. Lord, let us tap into the presence of Emmanuel this holiday season to remember that you are not just the babe in the manger, but that you are present with us. You are present in our hearts. You are present in our families. You are present in all creation. You are present, especially in the poor and the marginalized, and that your presence remains with us through the through our Eucharist and our Eucharistic communities. Lord, thank you for that presence that you will give to us, that you continue to give to us at this time of year and all year. Lord, through your presence, grace us with the ability to be your hands and your feet, and that we may provide hope for all those who are seeking, all those who are lost, all those on the margins, and all those who will come to make a moment of return to faith. Lord, help us to help others and guide us all together towards your holy kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. So, Paul, I guess the first question or first sort of uh, piece is where can people find your book? Where can people find this book? Hope for the holidays. Um, it is uh, available very, uh, very much so on paulistpress.com. Paulistpress.com is the website um, that is the publisher of this book. And so you can certainly find it there. Um, or if you, or again, at your favorite online bookseller, perhaps might have it as well. Um, so those are some places to, uh, to seek it out. I also recommend uh, for those who are interested in some of Paul's other writings, I would very much recommend Hope, for the Ashes, Hope in the Ashes, um, which is his sort of Lenten Easter type book. Do you have that one present as well? I don't actually uh, know. I know. I've, but you know, it's funny because I've been, you know, I've been written books now too called Hope and then something, whether hope for the ashes or hope for the holidays. Um, so um, as you can tell, I'm a person of great hope. I, I believe tomorrow will always be better than today. Um, our faith tells us so. So yeah, um, but both books are available through the Paulist Press and through your favorite online bookseller. And I recommend the either book as a great gift for family members. They're both very quick reads. Uh, it's not very thick at all. So it's an easy, easy enough read for really anyone in your life that wants to, or yourself, um, as Paul recommended early, for us to prepare ourselves first. And so if there is someone else in your life, after you've done some reflecting and reading, that would be a benefit from this, I highly recommend going to paulspress.com as well. Um, thank you again, Paul, for, for your presentation and for the discussion. And thank you everyone who turned in and joined us today. We'll have a recording of this webinar on YouTube, hopefully in the next week or so. Though with the Thanksgiving holiday, it may take a little bit longer, admittedly. Um, but please check our website, catholicapostlecenter.org, for the link. It is free to share. Um, and please share with anyone and everyone who would, be who would find benefit from this webinar. If you haven't yet found us on social media, please like and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram in the hope that we will continue to reach more people and continue to spread the gospel. And the words of St. Vincent Pilati, may the charity of Christ urge us on. Thank you all. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.